Today we're going to be talking about recurrent pregnancy loss, or commonly uh, referred to as RPL. The way this talk's going to go is I'm going to go through the, the most common uh, known reasons for recurrent pregnancy loss, go through their diagnoses and then treatment, and then at the, at the end I'll leave you with a pie chart that kind of gives you an overview of the percentages of those uh, etiologies for recurrent pregnancy loss. The first thing we have to do is understand the, the, the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss, and it has changed over time. Currently, recurrent pregnancy loss is described as a patient who has had greater than or equal to two um, pregnancy losses in their history. It used to be three pregnancy losses, but now it's commonly referred to as anything greater than two. The first thing we're going to start with in terms of possible etiologies is autoimmune. Now, autoimmune obviously has a very wide range of uh, possibilities, but the main ones we focus on with recurrent pregnancy loss are what are called antiphospholipid antibodies, or commonly referred to as APA. The main ones that we look at with antiphospholipid antibodies in recurrent pregnancy loss are lupus anticoagulant, or LA, anti-cardiolipin antibody, ACA, beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody, and then some people will put in the phosphatidyl serine or phosphatidyl threonine. These are not as commonly tested, but they will uh, come up on some of the um, tests that you see for recurrent pregnancy loss. The main issue with autoimmune etiology or um, for recurrent pregnancy loss and, and the antiphospholipid antibodies is that there is a theory that there is poor or decreased placentation. What I mean by that is there is poor invasion of the trophoblast cells of the placenta and therefore there is not a good implantation and therefore it will re re um, a result in a pregnancy loss. The main issue you have to realize with these uh, antiphospholipid antibodies is that you need two positive tests greater than 12 weeks apart in the patient. So that's an important diagnostic criteria. Now that we've talked about how to diagnose the antiphospholipid antibodies, we need to talk about the treatment. Obviously if they've had antiphospholipid antibodies and have their recurrent pregnancy loss, the way you treat this or how you want to treat this is to improve their placentation as mentioned before. And the way that's commonly done is with baby aspirin, heparin, or Lovenox. And typically, if you have a diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibodies, you're going to have the maternal fetal medicine specialist help you with the, the management and how just to give these medicines. As a final thought for the autoimmune or the antiphospholipid antibody etiology of recurrent pregnancy loss, remember that it occurs up to 20% of the time um, when you have patients with RPL. The second factor or etiology of recurrent pregnancy loss we're going to talk about is anatomic. And the main thing we're talking about here is the uterus. You can imagine if you draw a uterus, you can imagine the environment that the embryo is supposed to be in cannot be a hostile environment in the uterine cavity, cannot have any space occupying lesions, and it has to be a normal cavity. So when we talk about anatomic um, abnormalities of the uterus, the main issues we're talking about is what's called a uterine septum, where they can have a fibrous band of tissue at the top part of the uterus, uterine fibroids, which are smooth muscle overgrowth that can impair the cavity or um, can impair the environment of the cavity, and then uterine polyps, which are overgrowths of the endometrial lining of the cavity, and this can create a hostile environment for poor implantation and then uh, pregnancy loss that way. For anatomic uh, etiologies, this occurs up to 15% of the time, and the vast majority are going to be these uterine septum, which is a problem with, remembering embryology, mullerian development. So mullerian are the tubes the mullerian tubes or ducts are the ones that form the um, uterus and we'll talk about a uterine septum more. So let's talk about the uterine septum and first we have to talk about the embryolog embryological development of the uterus. I've already mentioned that the uterus um, comes from the mullerian ducts and the mullerian ducts basically start as two tubes on either side of the uh, embryo. As they develop these ducts will come together 
and join in the midline and what's supposed to happen is this is supposed to regress and you get a normal appearing uterine cavity which typically looks like an upside down triangle. However, if this doesn't regress, you can have this remnant of a uterine septum. And the depth of this is variable, but it can be all the way down to the cervical um, level. The main issue with the uterine septum, as I mentioned before, is that this is typically fibrous tissue and is not healthy endometrium as seen in the other parts of the uterus. So you can imagine the tube sit here. When an embryo comes in and implants, say, on this uterine septum, there's an initially enough blood supply to get a positive pregnancy test or even possibly an early pregnancy ultrasound. However, because this is fibrous tissue, the vascular supply is depleted quickly for that embryo and it results in a pregnancy loss. To diagnose a uterine architecture problem, we do a procedure called, typically called a 3D sonohistogram. And that's a um, procedure where we place a tiny catheter inside the cervix and we fill the uterine cavity with saline so it distends it. And then we take a 3D ultrasound of the image. Because typically what we want to see, as mentioned before, is an upside down triangle with smooth borders all the way around. And the 3D sono can reveal a uterine septum it can reveal fibroids and it can reveal polyps and so this is a very good diagnostic tool for um, looking at common possible etiology, common etiologies of recurrent pregnancy loss that way of the uterine architecture other procedures or um, to, um, evaluations can be a hysterosalpingogram which is a dye test as well or sometimes you can typically just see them on a regular ultrasound as well this is usually the first line uh, therapy and diagnostic tool that is used. In terms of treatment, obviously if you have a uterine septum or fibroids, you're going to go in hysteroscopically, which is a camera inside the uterus and uh, removing that septum. So again, we have our triangle here, the septum here. Camera comes in here and we just basically shave the septum back to the level of where the tubes come in and then you get your normal uterine cavity that way. With a fibroid, we can do the same thing. If the fibroid's inside the cavity, we can go in with a hysteroscope, resect the fibroid, and again, remove that fibroid and have a normal cavity, and the same thing for a polyp. We take the polyp out the same way. And that should restore the uterine cavity to where it could hopefully carry a pregnancy to term at that point. Moving forward, another topic we often um, look at look into for an etiology of recurrent pregnancy loss is genetics now there are a number of genetic syndromes um, that can cause hematologic problems blood clotting issues um, and also connective tissue dis disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos which I will not go into the main genetic uh, component we're looking at in re recurrent pregnancy loss and talking about here is the karyotype or the chromosome makeup of mother and father you'll remember from biology there are basically two, a set of uh, two chromosomes, one for mom, one from dad. Now the issue is when sperm or, egg or, or eggs are made, these crosstalk. And when they crosstalk, you can have translocation of information. So whereas this part of this chromosome moves to this part. Now in us, or a, a fully developed human, if they have that as they're making their eggs or sperm, this doesn't matter because the amount of information is the same, it's just simply rearranged. However, when they go to make gametes, the sperm or the eggs, because they have to split this, you can imagine that one is going to have too much information and one is not going to have enough information. And so this is what leads to recurrent pregnancy loss. Now this occurs in about 3 to 5% of the time in folks who have recurrent pregnancy loss. Now obviously, there's no f fix, so to speak, to this because this is our genetics and we can't change the translocation. However, we can do in vitro fertilization or IVF with something called PGS or preimplantation ge uh, genetic um, diagnosis or PGD, preimplantation genetic, uh, excuse me, genetic screening and genetic diagnosis. Now, what this involves is with IVF, we create embryos by taking the uh, female's eggs and uh, her husband's sperm, placing them together and making embryos. And then in those embryos with all the cells, they actually do a biopsy, so they take a cell out and run tests on that cell to see, again, the chromosome makeup. Assuming they have a normal 
embryo with a normal amount of chromosomal information and normally arranged chromosomes, that's the embryo that we then transfer back into the female to hopefully have a pregnancy that way. That's usually the, um, the highest chance of uh, normal, and, uh, normal um, pregnancy and also decreases the chance for the recurrent pregnancy loss.